Well, thanks very much for that kind introduction. Um, just a, a caveat, I'm doing this live from home. Uh, I've got a great internet connection, but whenever I uh, start talking, sometimes our cats like to get involved. So if you hear some meowing in the background, uh, ju just ignore it. Uh, that's that's, that's the, the kitties trying to participate in the discussion. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a topic that uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Sort of, well, when we published this book, uh, The Madhouse Effect, last fall, uh, Tom Tolles and myself, a number of colleagues said, you know, why are you guys publishing a book about climate change denialism? Uh, we're past all of that. Uh, you know, the, uh, denial uh, is a thing of the past. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that was before the latest election. In the wake of this latest election, uh, sadly, uh, we do find ourselves firmly back in the madhouse of climate change denialism, and our book uh, feels far more prescient than it really ought to. Um, so this is still something, obviously, that we're very much dealing with, the fact that despite the overwhelming evidence for human-caused climate change, um, there has been a concerted effort uh, by fossil fuel industry front groups and their paid advocates to sow doubt and confusion in the public mindset, uh, to confuse the public and policymakers about the overwhelming evidence that climate change is real and human caused. Um, so I'm going to sort of take you through uh, the various uh, chapters of, of the book um, using some of the key cartoons to try to tell the story. Uh, the first thing that is important to establish um, uh, whenever we talk about the science of climate change is, first of all, how does science actually work? Because there are uh, far too many uh, individuals um, who are prominent in our public discourse who present themselves as skeptics. Um, uh, they deny the overwhelming evidence of climate change and they attempt to uh, brand themselves skeptics. They like to compare themselves to Galileo. Uh, we call that the Galileo gambit. Um, the reality is that if you deny the overwhelming scientific evidence, that isn't true scientific skepticism. Skepticism is a very important thing in science. It's what keeps science on the path towards truth. And Real skepticism involves holding up uh, uh, all propositions to scrutiny from all directions um, and making sure that those propositions stand up to uh, appropriate good faith scrutiny. But the indiscriminate rejection of well-established science based on the flimsiest of arguments that don't stand up to the slightest bit of scrutiny that's not skepticism, that's contrarianism or denial. Um, and, you know, the climate change deniers on the internet and on our television screens uh, with the megaphone that they have, um, while they often like to present themselves as modern day Galileos, they're mostly just cranks dressed up as Galileo, which is the point of this Toll's cartoon. Um, the evidence is, as I said, overwhelming. Uh, no, it's not 100%. We don't have 100% certainty about climate change. We don't have 100% certainty about the theory of gravity, uh, but that doesn't make it safe to jump off a cliff. And yet, with science that is equally well established, the science of climate change, there are those who would happily take us off that cliff. One of uh, our pet peeves um, is the way uh, the discussion of the linkage between climate change and increasingly extreme weather events often gets framed uh, in the public discourse. Uh, it's almost a mantra uh, among uh, my climate scientist colleagues that when some massive hurricane or unprecedented uh, rainfall or flooding event, uh, an unprecedented drought like the one that's taking place in California, um, of course, uh, with intermittent flooding that they're experiencing, but that's still even the wet uh, winter isn't enough to take them out of what is now a roughly seven year long drought, unprecedented drought. Uh, 
while it is true that yes, you can never take any one meteorological event and say with certainty that it was caused by climate change because there's always some random component. Um, it's sort of like uh, saying that you know the baseball player um, who took steroids uh, and broke the all-time record for home runs, it would be like his defense being, well, you know, you can't prove that the steroids were responsible for any specific one of those home runs that I hit. Um, that is a, a loophole that, in this case, you could lose a planet through, as the small print says in this Toll, Toll's cartoon. So collectively, with the extreme uh, unprecedented flooding events we're seeing, unprecedented droughts, unprecedented heat waves. Um, that is the loading of the weather dice by climate change. And statistically, there is a clear relationship. We see the fingerprint of human impact on climate in many of the unprecedented weather uh, events that we're seeing. Why should we care? Okay, well, you know, it's often... Uh, all about the polar bear, right? The polar bear has become sort of the, the poster child uh, for climate change. And uh, as I'll often note, uh, I show a polar bear stranded on an ice floe in every talk uh, about climate change that I give uh, because it's the law. Uh, you have to show, uh, well, no, obviously not. Uh, but the polar bear has sort of become uh, the icon of climate change. Um, and uh, while this cartoon, I think, nicely illustrates just what a profound uh, impact we're having on our environment. We're melting the Arctic sea ice, um, with the lowest amount of sea ice on record uh, globally right now. And ultimately, yes, the polar bear and the penguin might uh, meet under these unfortunate circumstances. Um, and so we are talking about a, a fundamental degradation of, of, of this planet, of the beauty and wonder, the, the, the magnificent, uh, you know, megafauna like the polar bear are, are, are threatened by climate change. But it isn't just about species. It isn't just about the wonder of nature. Um, it's about us uh, as well. Um, the fact that climate change is now fundamentally impacting us when it comes to food and water and land and national security and yes our economy because without a viable uh, planetary environment we don't have an economy um, climate change has already reached a level where it is threatening us in our lives on a daily basis it isn't just about exotic creatures way off in the Arctic, uh, it's about us as well. Um, now there has been a concerted effort, as I alluded to, uh, by fossil fuel interests and paid front groups and advocates to deny the reality of climate change. And, and typically there's a, you know, there's, there's a very common progression, uh, I sometimes call it the, the ladder of climate change denial, um, uh, the, the, the various stages of climate change denial, um, like uh, it's not, happening. You often hear this claim that uh, the globe isn't warming, that global warming has paused, despite the fact that 2014 was the warmest year on record globally until 2015, which was the warmest year on record globally, until 2016, which just came in as the warmest year on record globally. So there is no pause in global warming. Um, the only pause is in taking the actions necessary to do something about it. Now, that leads us then to the next stage of denial. So to the critics who say, okay, well, maybe it's warming, but it, hey, it could be natural, right? Um, after all, stovetop temperatures change naturally. Well, it's true that climate can change naturally, uh, but what we're seeing right now is a rate of warming, uh, a rate of increase in the concentrations of these greenhouse gases and a rate of warming of the planet uh, that is unlike uh, any uh, past period on record. And we can actually look at the factors that are implicated. We can take state-of-the-art climate models and subject them to just the natural factors like volcanoes, changes in solar output. And when we do that, what we find is that natural factors should have actually led to a cooling over the past half century. It is indeed only the human factor of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations that can explain the warming that we've seen. Well, then the next stage of denial is, okay, well, maybe it's happening and maybe it's at least partly caused by us, but, you know, it'll be self-correcting, right? 
problem will solve itself. Well, unless you mean that we will have enough global sea level rise to submerge all of the coal-fired power plants and all of our other infrastructure, no, uh, the problem isn't self-correcting. Uh, we can literally recreate the conditions that prevailed at the height of the Cretaceous period 100 million years ago um, when global sea level rise was uh, hundreds of feet higher than it is today, when global temperatures were substantially warmer than they are today. Um, we have the ability to recreate those conditions, not over a time scale of 100 million years like nature does, but over a time scale of 100 years, far more rapidly than we or other living thing can, things can possibly adapt to. Um, well, then the next stage of denial is, all right, well, maybe it's not self-correcting, but hey, it'll be good for us, right? Um, after all, melting ice, sh uh, ice sheets lift all boats, right? Well, no, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, has uh, rigorously assessed um, the impacts of climate change, and there is a consensus among the world's scientists that uh, if we warm the planet above two degrees Celsius, that's three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, which we're on course to do just in a matter of decades if we continue with business as usual burning of fossil fuels, then we will see uh, a fundamental threat, as I alluded to before, to um, human civilization, whether it's food or water or land or health or national security or our economy, uh, we will see a fundamental threat uh, that would call into question the viability of modern human civilization. So no, uh, it won't be good for us. Well, the final argument then in that canon of uh, denialist um, talking points is, well, you know, we took so long to get to this point now, after all this debate, um, uh, it's too late to do anything, right? And no, it isn't too late. Um, there is still time to make the changes in behavior necessary to avert catastrophic warming of the planet. Uh, but there isn't a whole lot of time. So there is great urgency in acting. So this war on climate science, the reason that uh, denialism is so widespread is that um, fossil fuel interests have funded um, this very cynical effort to call into question the reality of human-caused climate change, pretty much using the same textbook, the same playbook, that the uh, fossil that the uh, tobacco industry used in decades past to call into question the overwhelming scientific uh, evidence that their product was um, leading to uh, lung cancer and other health ailments. Well, the fossil fuel industry has taken the same playbook, many of the same players, many of the same professional climate change deniers who are advocating for fossil fuel interests today were getting paid by the tobacco industry in decades past to deny the science of uh, tobacco uh, products and impacts on our health. Uh, and like the last Japanese soldier uh, found uh, uh, just years ago, uh, still fighting World War II, uh, no doubt there will continue to be climate change deniers um, funded by fossil fuel interests as long as there are fossil fuels that continue to be burned. Well, there is great hypocrisy in the campaign to deny climate change, and there are numerous examples, and in the book uh, we talk about uh, many of them, but let me just talk about one example that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it involves uh, Ken Cuccinelli, uh, the former Attorney General of Virginia, uh, affectionately known as the Cooch. Uh, that is actually his nickname. Um, well, back in 2009, uh, Cuccinelli uh, attempted to uh, subpoena all of my personal emails from the time I was a faculty member at the University of Virginia using a civil subpoena. Um, his claim was that uh, since I was working on the science of climate change when I was there, and, uh, and that's clearly fraudulent science, um, uh, this was an appropriate use of the civil investigative demand uh, available to the Attorney General. Um, well, uh, the uh, Oops, actually, uh, sorry, the, the courts didn't uh, quite agree. Um, they ended up uh, dismissing uh, Cuccinelli's uh, subpoena um, 
because of the technicality that in his 40 page filing to the court, he had failed to provide any evidence of wrongdoing on my part or on the part of the University of Virginia. So it was thrown out. He uh, appealed it to the state Supreme Court, which ruled uh, against it a few years ago with prejudice, meaning they never, they, they never want to see an attorney general come back to the court with something like this again. Uh, Cuccinelli ran for governor. He lost to Terry McAuliffe, um, who I actively campaigned with. Uh, Cuccinelli is now uh, working on an oyster farm uh, on Tangier Island, an island in the Chesapeake Bay that is slowly succumbing to the effects of global sea level rise. And I promise I'm not making this up. You can go ahead and, and Google this. Um, there really is no hypocrisy um, like the hypocrisy of climate change denialism. Well, so solutions, what can we do about this? Assuming we get past this bad faith debate we continue to have in our politics about whether there is even a problem and we get on to the worthy debate about what to do about it, what do we do about it? Well, there are those who have advocated for uh, so-called geoengineering. The idea is that, well, we'll just perturb Earth's climate um, through some other planetary intervention, like shooting particles into the stratosphere or dumping iron into the ocean to fertilize algae or manipulating the global environment in some other completely untested and uncontrolled manner. And the title of our chapter, uh, Geoengineering, or What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Um, it in my view, uh, would be misguided for us to think that we can just cover up the effect of global warming by some mass, uh, massive uh, planetary engineering project that could easily go awry. The principle of unintended consequence reigns supreme when we talk about uh, these sorts of geoengineering uh, solutions. Now, they are convenient to fossil fuel interests who want to continue polluting. Um, after all, they can say, well, we'll continue to burn carbon and allow CO2 to build up in our atmosphere, but we'll just offset it through um, uh, one of these uh, geoengineering approaches, one of these untested, uh, uncontrolled uh, interventions with the one planet that we know that can support life. Um, well, it turns out that uh, that is a view shared by uh, the individual, uh, Rex Tillerson, former CEO of ExxonMobil, uh, now uh, the Secretary of State, now in charge of U.S. foreign policy. Um, he is on record as stating that he thinks that this is just an engineering problem that we can solve through planetary geoengineering. That's probably not a very wise solution. Um, the wise solution is to change our behavior, to stop uh, that pattern of behavior that we're engaged in, which is causing this problem, uh, the continued burning of fossil fuels. And we've seen some real progress over the last uh, several years, the monumental Paris Agreement that uh, got us on a path, uh, not of really solving the problem um, in one step, but it got us on a path towards stabilizing warming below those dangerous levels. Uh, if you total up, the commitments that were made in Paris by the nearly 200 countries uh, that signed on to the agreement. Um, those commitments are enough to reduce our carbon emissions enough to get us halfway from where we would be headed towards a five degree Celsius, nine degree Fahrenheit catastrophic warming of the planet by the end of, uh, of the century, halfway to that two degree Celsius um, threshold of dangerous interference. So it doesn't quite get us to where we need to go, but it gets us on a path where uh, with a renewed and uh, more concerted uh, commitments in the future, we can now see our way towards stabilizing warming below dangerous levels. Uh, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis with his encyclical um, uh, a year and a half ago helped reframe uh, the discussion uh, of climate change in a helpful way because it's not just about uh, our economy, land, food, water, um, human health, or any of these other things. Fundamentally, this is about uh, what sort of planet we want to leave behind for our children and grandchildren and not fundamentally degrading uh, 
our planet uh, for future generations. So that has helped uh, build a global consensus and, and arguably was an important factor in this monumental Paris Agreement. But we face a monumental challenge now. Um, as I said, uh, our, our book should not have been as relevant as it is. A book that was published last year on climate change denial. I wish that it was irrelevant now, but sadly it's not. We have a president who is a committed climate change denier and has appointed climate change deniers to all of the key positions of science policy, EPA, Department of Energy, um, as we've seen, Secretary of State. Uh, he's appointed a veritable dream team of climate change deniers. And we're likely uh, to have to face um, a, an atmosphere of policy inaction at the executive level. Um, uh, we probably won't see Trump build on the tremendous successes of the previous administration. And we have a Congress that's led by climate change denying Republicans. Uh, does that mean that there's no hope? Uh, no. Uh, it means that we are going to have to see far more progress at the grassroots level. There's a lot of progress being made at the state level right now. California uh, is helping lead the way, um, growing their economy while uh, putting a price on carbon and, and incentivizing renewable energy and dramatically lowering their carbon footprint. Um, and other states, other West Coast states have joined in. The New England states have a consortium to put a price on carbon and incentivize renewable energy. So we're seeing a lot of action at the local level, at the municipal level, at the state level, and even as states band together. And we're seeing a lot of evident, uh, a lot of progress at the global level. We've actually seen carbon emissions come down globally over the last year. The numbers just came in for the U.S. We saw a drop in domestic carbon emissions uh, over the last year. So we're starting to turn the corner uh, without leadership at the national level from the executive branch or Congress. Uh, we're going to need grassroots up efforts. Uh, monumental grassroots up efforts to keep the momentum going. Hopefully, a couple years or four years into the future, when maybe we will see a dramatic shift in the political winds and we will have a more favorable environment uh, at the top level for action on climate change. In, in the meantime, we have to make sure that we maintain progress in attacking this problem. And there's so much that we can do individually. There's so much that is being done at the local level. And as we've seen at the state level, um, we just have to uh, keep, uh, keep pressure on our policymakers to keep that progress going um, until we reach a more favorable uh, point in our domestic politics. And I think I will leave it uh, actually I will leave it there. Thank you very much. We do have a few minutes for, uh, did we, were we going to do questions or? So we're, um, we're not really set up for that because okay. there's, there's only small gaps between, um, uh, between talks. We, we do have a Slack channel. Um, and since we do have about five minutes before the next, uh, the next, chat, uh, the next talk, I can take a couple of questions if anyone has one on Slack. I just wanted to say something as well, which was, yeah. well, firstly, thank you very much for that fantastic talk. Fantastic, but sobering talk as well. I think, you know, it's certainly since November, I've been been uh, rather worried of, uh, <laughs> about what the, uh, the, the, the national direction is going to be on these things. Yeah. And I think the way you put it, grassroots up is, it's absolutely absolutely the key. That's why we've started Sustainable UX, is to, to empower individual designers to think about what they can do both personally, and that's where things like remote working come in, but also collectively as a profession, and, and some of our talks today have been about that. So hopefully uh, our audience has has taken that to heart, and, and we can now really see that before this was one thing, but now it really is up to us, because no one's really going to come and save us, is, is my yeah. takeaway.
That, that's right. And it, but let me say that you know Trump and congressional Republicans are not going to be able to turn back the tide of history. The, you know the the rest of the world has decided that it's time to move on from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, and that's going to be the great economic revolution of this century, uh, the renewable energy revolution. So at this point, it's simply a matter of whether we get on board or not. Do we get left behind? Um, but we are going to solve this problem. The, the world has made up its mind, regardless of what the U.S. decides to do at this point. Right. Thank you. Uh, we're now getting a couple of questions coming through. Um, first one um, is around the the rhetoric around climate change and but there's there's we we observe uh, this phenomenon of of people employing their confirmation bias or being able to ignore true facts <laughs> as opposed to alt facts uh, so long as they confirm facts. their existing beliefs. Um, do you, did you have any specific tactics or suggestions for for how people can overcome that sort of uh, entrenched attitude? Uh, we, we know that sometimes hitting people overhead with facts. Just makes them dig in their heels. So, yeah. what are some ways around those types of uh, uh, intransigence? Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, those of us on the front lines of the climate, you know, debate have been dealing with fake news and alternative facts for years now. So, you know, these terms are now part of our our, our public uh, lexicon, uh, and we, we we see this writ large now in our politics. But we've been dealing with this for some time. Um, you know, my uh, my suggestion would be, you know, there are uh, those who see this issue now uh, through an entirely ideological lens. And as you allude to, they're not open to facts or data or logic. Um, and there may be very little that can change their mind at this point. That's a pretty small sort of uh, contingent in our population, maybe 15 uh, percent, 20 percent at most. Um, some of them may be, uh, you know, it, because they're not seeing it through the lens of facts and, and data, um, sometimes approaching them from a different angle. Um, if, if they care about national security, making them aware of the fact that our leading national security experts consider climate change the greatest threat to us on an, uh, from a national security standpoint that might get them to think about the issue in a different way, uh, for example. And there are other ways to frame it. Uh, for those in the business community, well, you know, the, the bis business community is extremely frightened uh, at their bottom line um, uh, if, we do, if we fail to act uh, on climate change. And that's why you're seeing leading businesses across the U.S. Uh, pleading, actually, for Donald Trump to take action mm -hmm. on this problem. So the business community, the national security uh, community, uh, these are voices that we haven't necessarily seen before and voices that frankly may be more credible to certain um, target constituencies than a, a pointy-headed academic like me or somebody from a non-governmental uh, you know, environmental organization. Uh, that having been said, I think that given the limited energy and resources we have, uh, there's the sweet spot is the much larger sort of what I call the confused middle. People who aren't ideologically opposed to this issue, who don't necessarily see it as a part of their um, you know, tribal political identity to deny climate change, but they have been subject to this disinformation campaign, all this misinformation and disinformation, and they're confused and, and they're unaware of the fact that there is a strong scientific consensus. They can easily be brought along by providing them the information and the resources uh, necessary for them to understand just how widespread a consensus there is, a scientific consensus, and, 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 and how much of a threat um, climate change really does represent if we don't do something. Thank you. I, I, know, I like the, the one I like as well as the, um, you know, some people don't like to talk about or hear about climate change, but everybody likes clean power. That's, uh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. If you ask, you know, the American public, if you look at polling, do you support clean energy, renewable energy? It's only like 70, 80 percent of the public. So we we are on the right side of this issue, whether we realize it or not. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, let me finally say, I know time is limited for questions and, and we're, uh, we have to move on. Um, I'm happy to engage with people online. I'm active on Twitter at Michael E. Mann, so feel free to engage me there as well. Uh, and thanks, everybody.